We just went live and uh, are broadcasting, and this is Dan Dury, and um, uh, really want to welcome all of you uh, to the seminar. We have almost uh, 350 people that are um, uh, logged, uh, registered for this, and um, it shows that the interest has really been in this uh, subject. First, I want to make sure that everybody is keeping safe and uh, themselves and their family at this uh, important times. And what we're going to do today is a little different than a lot of the Zooms that we've been on um, uh, that were about how to uh, get ready for the shutdown. And this one is a little more focused on a little bit more long term about some of the things that people are looking to maybe change in their practice. Uh, we've been getting a tremendous amount of uh, interest in office space cataract surgery and a lot of questions are coming. So we thought we'd have a session like this where you could really talk to people that are experienced with this and get, and get a lot of the questions answered directly. Um, and during this, we're gonna, uh, obviously we're all, all on Zoom and we're getting kind of familiar with that, but there's a chat feature that we've opened up on this. So if you have questions, go ahead and just type them in on the chat session that can go directly to the panelists even while we're speaking. And then uh, we can even, uh, uh, there's also a Q&A button that we'll try to get to your questions. So we're gonna try to keep this as casual as possible and um, uh, get to uh, all the answers uh, and any that we can't get to, we'll make sure we get to online to all the participants. Um, I think you notice this is sponsored by uh, Iowa Partners. Uh, that's a company, it's Kansas City based. Um, uh, my partners have um, uh, been um, involved in this area and we've done about 100 centers uh, over the last 15 years with uh, lens-based uh, Iowa, uh, office-based Iowa surgery. So there's a lot of experience and we have a turnkey business model that people have had a lot of interest in. But the focus really today is in uh, getting some of the questions that come up uh, quite often answered by uh, experienced people. And when I evaluate technology or services in ophthalmology, I always go through four simple things. Um, is it safe? Is it effective? And nowadays, two other ones, is it convenient? Is it cost effective? So we're gonna kind of focus some of the direction on this. And our panelists today are uh, Lance Kugler uh, from uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, Lance has been involved in this process for uh, a long time and it'll give us a lot of his insight. Um, uh, Allison Tindler from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and uh, Allison started her new practice with an office-based uh, surgery center, and she can give us some input with that. She even has a little video walkthrough, uh, I think that she's going to show us, that kind of shows that how it fits in the practice. Uh, Young Choi from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Young's uh, uh, um, had a lot of experience with office-based surgery and working with his OD referral network. And then Paul Kropecki has joined us and Paul is gonna give a little bit of the educational things and questions that's coming on how to actually grow practices, especially in the private pay area that uh, he has a lot of experience in. So I'd like to start out with you, Lance, uh, with the first question, which always is number one on my list is, is safety. Um, and okay. what if, uh, I know you're, you're, you're um, uh, somebody evaluates these things carefully, but. How did you look at the safety and, and uh, what do you think of uh, the, the safety uh, question that everybody has? Sure, <clears throat> you bet. And thanks for having me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a, a Lance Kugler from Omaha, Nebraska. I'm a refractive surgeon here. Uh, we, we do all seven refractive procedures and uh, recent years have a big emphasis on lens-based refractive. And I'll tell you a little bit about kind of my history, how I arrived at having an office-based uh, center. So I started first looking into it at about 2015. And up until that point, I had been going to a really nice ASC. I mean, they had great equipment, great staff, and a, what I thought was a pretty good patient experience. But it became pretty clear to me that I really wanted to have a little bit more control over that situation. You know, any, anytime we wanted to get some new equipment, it had to go through a committee of people who didn't really understand we were trying to do with it. Um, I didn't have control over the schedule the way I wanted in terms of, you know, times that were best for patients and for our efficiency. And even though the patient experience was really good, it wasn't as good as our LASIK patients were having in our office. And I could tell a big disconnect there. And so um, we wanted to improve that. And we also had 
a lot of confusing issues around billing for premium services. You know, they would get these bills from the ASC, then the ASC never really understood what premium cataract surgery was. So these sorts of things were the, the things that drove me to consider making the change. And I was aware of a few um, outpatient or office-based surgery centers at that time. So I started to look into it. And, you know, as Dan said, I tend to be a, a pretty deep uh, analyst on things. And my biggest concern was safety. I think that's everybody's first concern. Because when you hear about an office-based center, you think it's like a clean room or a, you know, a procedure room. And, you know, it didn't take me very long to realize that this isn't what this is. This is operating rooms that are in your office. They're just classified differently. And so there, fortunately, around the time I was, I was looking, uh, there was a really nice um, Kaiser a study out of the Kaiser system, and I'll, sh I'll show a slide on that later, that outlined the safety of office-based procedures compared to hospital-based or ASC and showed as good or better results across the board. So that was, the timing of that was good because it was helpful to have that kind of data. And I started to, you know, talk to other colleagues about it who had done it. And like I said, it was pretty clear that this was a real operating room. You know, the, the concept of an ASC is really just an artificial construct. It's established for billing purposes and accreditation purposes. But the only thing that makes an ASC an ASC is the whoever says it is. And so, you know, what I learned that what we could do with an office-based surgery center was, was build something to the same or better standards for eyes that ASCs require and that we can get accredited for that. And so we can build an accredited center in our office that's just as safe or safer than an ASC. And so that helped me uh, really feel comfortable with that. We opened our center in early 2018. Um, we designed it for RLE and ICL and premium cataract surgery from day one. That was the goal. The, ex the entire experience was designed around those services got the equipment I wanted, uh, we could do anesthesia the way I wanted. We can do same day, short, uh, short interval bilateral. Um, and kind of things that I noticed was how much patients, not only do they like it, but they expect it. So I always thought that the ASC I was going to was great. I, you know, I knew they were safe. I knew they did a good job, but it wasn't until we had our own center that I realized for patients to tell them that they're gonna go somewhere else was a really big deal to them because they had already decided they wanted to come here for surgery. They had invested their trust in us. And then we're telling them, oh, here's this third party that you're going to. We considered extension of what we're doing, but they never considered it that way. They considered it another entity. And that was a, that was a kind of an enlightening thing that I realized. And we were able to remove the billing confusion. The anxiety goes down dramatically. And this is another question we often get about the safety is, well, how can you do this without you know, deep anesthesia. I've always done my cataracts that way. And what you find is in the office setting, patients are instantly less anxious because you're not putting a IV in and a gown and it doesn't feel like a hospital healthcare setting. It feels more like a comfortable office setting. So they're coming in with less anxiety and it doesn't feel like they're having something massively invasive done. And so just that whole experience uh, really helped. And it allowed us to uh, enjoy a higher conversion rate on our RLE, on our premium cataract surgery, on our ICL. It was the exact same conversion rate change that we saw when we moved our LASIK lasers in the house, you know, over 10 years ago. We, we made that change and that also had the same benefit there. So it's, it's along the same lines. In terms of, um, you know, back to safety, um, I'll show you kind of the, some of the data that I was looking at when we were making this decision. Okay. So there, again, there was the study out of the Kaiser group, Mark Packer and, and his group um, came out with this in 2016, actually 2015 data, but really nice study. And Basically, the summary is, is that they looked at in-office versus comparable ASC data, and they found that uh, endophthalmitis was actually uh, less in their, and this is a big study, 21,000 patients, 21,501 eyes. They had an endophthalmitis rate of 0%, uh, and red detachment was actually better than the ASC data. Vitreous loss was 
better than ASC data and perioperative AE was negligible at zero in both. And what's nice about coming into the office based surgery now, which I didn't have this data in 2015 when I was looking at this, but um, now we do. And if you look at IOR's internal data from uh, their office based surgery experience, they have 5,000 IOL surgeries now. The data compares uh, actually a little bit better than what the Kaiser study did. And so we can even take, so Kaiser was comparing, you know, uh, ASC to office space, and now we're comparing our current version of office space to what was being done three or four years ago, and we're finding that it's, it's improved even more uh, since then. So uh, that data has been, been helpful in kind of establishing the safety in a, in a, um, in a scientific way. But, um, what I've found just anecdotally in, in our experience is our own internal rates. I feel more comfortable operating in our center than I do at ASC. Um, I had a fellow with me the past uh, year and a half and his comment was he vastly preferred doing surgery in our center compared to the ASC. And that was somebody that was just coming in very raw. Um, and so all that kind of leads to the same conclusion, which was the safety has been something that we feel really good about. Sounds great. And a couple of questions from the audience, and I think this is good clarification, is um, people are confusing a little bit. ASCs, ambulatory surgery centers, kind of come in two varieties. There's multi-specialty ASCs, uh, which we kind of all know there were lots of different surgeries that they are done plus eyes. Then there's single specialty ASCs where they're kind of an ASC connected with your ophthalmology office. And then there is office-based surgery, and this is a different entity. It's not a separate licensed facility. It's part of your practice. It's under your license. So this is a different business model altogether. So just there, uh, I just wanted to answer that up front. What we're talking about is something that's quite different from an ASC, either a specially specific or um, multi-specialty. Um, Allison, I think this feeds in pretty well, that answer I just had to, um, uh, you know, your office, because uh, you're one of the uh, first people that started out from day one. And maybe you can give us a little bit of your background. Uh, and then uh, uh, I know that you have a little walkthrough video, which I think everybody would like to see. That sounds great, Dan. Um, it's also my honor to be um, here with everybody today. Um, so thank you for allowing me to, to be part of that. Um, my name is Allison Tendler. I am an ophthalmologist in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I have, uh, um, in July, I opened my uh, own office and inside of that an office-based um, surgical suite where we started um, performing um, some cases um, pretty, you know, about a month or so after we, we started. I am a cornea specialist by training and happen to do a lot of um, cataracts, um, lens-based uh, refractive surgeries, and then I happen to do a lot of um, uh, oculoplastics and have an aesthetic center as well so that's um, kind of what my what my practice is is based around and uh, um, I think this would be a great time for us to go ahead and um, we'll kind of give you a walkthrough um, with uh, the video so Brooke is going to show a video here and then Allison's going to voice over it yeah so one of the goals um, as I kind of tried to vision um, and envision where I wanted my, my, my patients to be. Um, I wanted them to feel like, what's the space? What did I want them to experience when they came in? And uh, one of those things was kind of a, a hotel-like feel um, or a boutique type thing where it's small, it's intimate, it's personalized. And yet when you walk in, you feel like um, you're automatically, you know, you feel special yet you also feel very much at home. It's like you're, you're coming home. And Lance um, kind of talked about the, the decreasing anxiety. And I've worked in both um, hospitals and ASCs uh, performing surgeries. And one thing I really did not anticipate was the fact that uh, the psychology of how different not only my patients would feel, as they came in um, on their day of surgery um, and how different the anxiety level of my staff was. Um, we tend to, it just tends to, tends to be a calmer environment. So the patients also sense that. 
Um, and then as a surgeon as well, I, I thoroughly enjoy my, my day and that extra um, one on one special time. So you can see um, the um, surgery suite is definitely open um, to, the, to the rest of the clinic. However, um, very private at the same time. We don't have a lot of um, throughput, so we definitely were already social distancing before that became the thing. But yet you saw the, um, the prior area, this is the post-op area um, where we have people um, you know, kind of recline and have their beverages for, uh, for a few minutes. Um, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's kind of the end there. So you kind of get a sense of the feel that, that um, my facility has. I wanted uh, transparency. I wanted um, patients and their family to be able to um, basically, they're walking in and there's there's the office space uh, suite right there. Although that doesn't cause increased anxiety, I think it actually lessens it. The other thing I really um, noticed was a control over schedule. If I happen to be gone or a patient has a circumstance where we need to add a case on here, um, we're able to do that. And I think in this era of what we're going to have to do with COVID is going to be very important to help spacing. We've got a really firm control over being able to space um, our patients out to minimize their exposure to other uh, other people. The other thing that I love is the staff consistency. So I think that also decreases anxiety for patients when it's the same staff who is seeing them preoperatively, doing their workups, doing their surgical counseling, and those are the same people that they get to see that day of surgery. So they've already been here. They've already been quote unquote to our home and in our home and, and know, who we, know who we are. Um, uh, with lower anxiety, I feel that we're also able to decrease what we need to do from an anesthesia standpoint. I feel extremely comfortable um, with um, performing surgery and performing surgery to the highest standards in my facility and also feel that I'm um, providing good uh, um, anesthesia for patients and that they're calm and relaxed. Um, Everybody's very nervous on a, I mean, everybody's nervous on a first day, um, but the, um, just knowing people, that people factor, that high touch factor, they're not meeting a whole bunch of different people on, you know, each time they come in, you get the, you get the same staff. And I, I cannot, until you experience that, until you really um, are here on a surgery day, experience the lower level of anxiety all around, um, it's a really fun day. Sounds good. Uh, one of the audience questions that came up feeds in really well. I'm going to introduce uh, Young Choi, and then we'll uh, have all three of them answering some of the questions. But Young, we're getting some questions about bilateral surgery, and I know you have some experience with that. So might want to introduce yourself, sure. um, uh, talk a little bit about your experience, and a and, um, uh, little bit. Um, uh, we've, we all know that everybody's starting back up again, a little bit of what you're doing to kind of get back the post COVID-19 situation with your practice. Sure. My name is young Troy. I've got a practice in Birmingham, Alabama, and I've got a little, um, just a PowerPoint. I'll just kind of shift gears from Allison and Lance here. So let me share my screen with you guys. So I've titled my talk Crossing the Bridge because uh, you know, this is a very difficult times and I'm sure we're, we're all in the same boat. Um, I've been doing office space cataract surgery for about two years. To date, I've done over 800 cases, uh, no endophthalmitis, no PC tear. Well over 95% of the patients do fine on oral sedation and what I uh, like to call vocal local, which is just simply talking to the patients for. Uh, and just letting them know everything is okay. I still perform majority of my cases at our, at our local ASC. I do about three times that volume. Um, however, I am slowly transitioning to office-based cataract surgery. And like many of you, uh, during, during this pandemic, I really wasn't sure what's gonna happen. It seemed daunting and overwhelming. So for me, I, I hope this helps you. I started to go back to basics uh, for me. I thought about patient care, you know, uh, what allowed me to thrive on this side of the bank was simply focusing on patients and taking great care of them, like all of you, and making safe, safety a top priority. 
Um, and two years ago, when I started implementing office-based cataract surgery, that trust that my patients and my referring doctors in the community had made it really easy for me to um, implement office-based cataract surgery. And during this pandemic, we decided to be proactive about what we need to do uh, to be part of the solution. And so one of the things that we did, like many of you, we did our own COVID-19 questionnaire. We were checking temperature of patients and staff. We were all wearing the PPE. No one is in the waiting room. We had patients in the, in the car waiting until they got called back, only one patient at a time. Um, and we also shared our proactive measures with our referring doctors, and we try to be a resource center. And on March 18, uh, per the Academy recommendation, we stopped operating um, and we stopped clinic and immediately transitioned to telehealth. So we, know, we knew that we had to adjust my schedule. Before COVID-19, I was operating three days a week. After COVID, well, after COVID-19, we can't go back to the way things were. So we knew, we knew that we had to be slow and steady and we knew that we had to expand the number of days. So uh, we're looking at operating four or five days a week and considering weekends and possibly even nights. I know my staff really loves that. Uh, we've expanded telehealth tonight um, to include nighttime. And again, safety over speed and number. And this is something that I always say during surgery, best efficiency is no complications. Now, how do you increase efficiency during this time? Why well, view all cataract surgery as being a refractive procedure? Uh, cataract surgery, um, well, I'm sorry, refractive cataract surgery is about 40% uh, of our volume and we had a staff meeting and we're gonna obviously continue that and try to go for a, even a higher conversion rate. We're also gonna minimize visits. I've been doing same day cataract surgery for 12 plus years. I find that just like Lance has said and Allison has said, um, office-based cataract surgery makes a lot of sense because we're cutting out a, an additional visit to a, a surgery center or a hospital. Uh, I do bilateral refractive lens exchange and I think Bilateral cataract surgery is something that we may want to discuss in the future. In my clinic right now, we're doing what's called one-way flow. Patients and staff, we just go in one, uh, one direction. Uh, there's gonna be no one in the waiting room, and of course, we're gonna stay flexible and nimble. So earlier this month, my staff and I, we met, we picked May 4th as our soft start date. We know that we have to be flexible. By picking a day, this is, given us, um, my, my staff and myself included, some hope. Uh, we um, gave us a goal to work towards, and it really also provided job security for my staff. Uh, during this time, this month of April, we reached out to referring doctors. We called patients about doing second eyes. And just this past week, I started implementing extreme, what I call extreme social distancing clinic. And that's just bringing one patient at a time. And by doing all these proactive things, we are pretty much booked the entire month of May. Uh, and, you know, fortune would have it, our governor lifted the ban. So um, effective end of today. Uh, so it works out nicely and our timing just worked out perfectly. Office-based cataract surgery has been really critical for me because uh, I really enjoy, just like everyone else has said, doing surgery in my clinic. Uh, it's just as safe. Uh, and I think I can practice extreme social distancing in my clinic that I don't think I can practice really in an ASC or hospital setting. A lot of patients don't want to go to a hospital setting. Um, to give you an example, when I, go, when I go to a local ASC, you know, I may have 20 plus patients waiting to have surgery. Well, it's kind of hard to practice social distancing when you have that many people and family members with them. Uh, I obviously, you know, post COVID, well, COVID era, we're going to decrease that number, but you're still gonna have difficulty, I think, implementing social distancing. The other advantages, in my opinion, that I have with office-based cataract surgery is, you know, you have to consider that hospitals and ASCs are gonna prioritize their cases. Orthopedic cases may bump ophthalmology cases and block times for surgeons may be reduced, or you may have to share your block time with other surgeons who also have backlogs. Um, I was talking to a good friend of mine, 
And we take this for granted, but staffing may be an issue. Just because you're ready in the hospital or ASC is giving you time, doesn't mean all the staff will be ready to come back to work. So um, I hope this helps for me. I, I, this has been a very difficult time for like everybody else. And I like to look at this picture because it reminds me that I'm no longer under the bridge. I still can't see the other side, but at least I'm on the bridge and I'm going forward one step at a time. So thank you. Uh, sounds great, Young. And um, uh, I'm gonna bring Paul in a little bit later, but I, I'd like to do a little bit of Q&A with you. And uh, um, yeah, Young, you brought it up, and I think a lot of people are wondering, and I'd like to have all three of you answer this, is um, what cases do you not do in the office? And let me divide it into two ways. Obviously, Medicare doesn't pay for in-office surgery, so you're not doing your Medicare patients. Some HMOs and PPOs don't allow, they control where you can do the surgery. But of the cases that you could do in the office, uh, what do you do with patients with comorbidities or other things, and who do you think you can't go in the office? And um, um, Lance and Alan and Young, I'd really like a little uh, from all three of you, because you all have probably a little bit different experience of what percentage of patients who are re who, you, who you can get reimbursement would you uh, not do in your practice? Lance? Sure. So this, the answer to this continues to evolve. The, the longer that I do in-office uh, surgery, the more comfortable I am with different categories of patients. And when we first started our center, you know, I'm pretty conservative and we, you know, I would take a lot of the patients that I, I thought had any sort of comorbidity. So if they had a hypertension, you know, I, I would take them to the ASC just because I like that extra layer of monitoring they had. But the more that I started doing surgery in our office, the more I realized that we could manage those things quite well here uh, with the right protocols and, and that the ASC wasn't really adding anything to those cases. So I would say the cases that uh, at this point, two years into it, the cases that we would still take to an ASC, other than the payer issues, um, if I had one of the ones that comes up every once in a while is body mass index. So there's certain body mass index um, levels that we're not uh, comfortable with here and our equipment isn't able to handle it. And so um, we take those to an ASC. Um, if they have a, um, you know, let's say they have something, the, the surgery itself is going to be complicated to a point where I need some equipment or um, instruments that, that we only are going to use once or twice a year. Um, I might take them to an ASC so that we don't have that, that equipment expense here. Um, and if they have, you know, significant comorbidity where I want a, an anesthesia team and a, and a PACU with, um, you know, that level of anesthesia support with an anesthesiologist on staff, uh, then that would be somebody that I would take there. And then the other, the other uh, category would be somebody that needs general anesthesia because uh, we can't do those in our center. We, we have a class B center here, which means we can do IV anesthesia, same as an ASC, but we can't do general, which is a class C center. So we, we can't do general. So if someone ever needed general, I would do that. Allison? Although uh, we're able to do the majority of our cases here, clearly there's some uh, patient types that just aren't, aren't, the, aren't the best for here. I can think of um, some people who might already have um, breathing issues um, uh, that we might be concerned about. Um, I've got somebody who has a, a trach who um, needing to do eyelid surgery on her. I don't. I feel like her best uh, safety is going to be um, with with a little bit more, um, you know, protective measures around her. Um, there are, um, you know, psychology, you know, the, the, there's a psychological uh, issue too. Patients always get a choice. They um, are told about our facility and if we feel that we um, are safe taking care of them here, but they always have a choice too, if they feel more comfortable or confident or want a little different degree of anesthesia, um, we might also decide to take them somewhere else. We are also a class A and a class B facility. So even though I do um, have access and ability to do IV sedation here, honestly, um, some cases that I always felt really needed IV sedation, we found interestingly don't um, and that we're able to um, keep their anxiety uh, level and um, perform their surgery very, very safely and actually diminish some of the, I feel, breathing issues and obstruction issues that people can have um, when they're under IV sedation. 
Now, Young, uh, how about you? Uh, because you said you're still doing the majority of your surgery. Uh, again, we'll get to reimbursement and admission, but if you took uh, reimbursement out of it, uh, what patients are you still take into the ASC? Oh, probably maybe one, two percent. You know, when I first started, I uh, just like what Lance said, I was very conservative. I would just take um, perfectly healthy people that uh, in the patient base, the pop population that we're, we're dealing with, obviously you're going to have comorbidities. So right now I really feel pretty comfortable. Um, I think everyone's kind of mentioned the ones that I wouldn't take. Uh, I, I agree with that. I would, again, maybe some patients who would say to me, hey, I don't, I want IV sedation or I, I want to go to an ASC, but those are few and far between. Sounds good. Uh, I want to get a little bit into, I'll give you a little bit of broad picture for the audience about reimbursement because that's always when people uh, um, uh, are thinking about that. They had that question almost first. Now, it's, this is not, uh, some people think that you have to pay for your office-based surgery out of your professional fee. That's separate. Your professional fee is the same whether you go do surgery at the hospital or the ASC or an office-based surgery center. So professional fee is separate. The reimbursement for the facility um, the uh, insurance companies uh, have realized that this is a cost-effective way to do surgery uh, because of the decreased amount of anesthesia, uh, because of the convenience, their patients like it. So commercial insurance uh, is paying for uh, in-office uh, cataract surgery in all of the centers that we have 17 centers that we work with uh, directly uh, right now and they're and reimbursing in all of them. And that includes Medicare Advantage is Medicare Advantage is, is processed by the commercial insurance. So that's a large percentage in a lot of areas. Straight Medicare, um, just straight Medicare does not cover in-office surgery yet. And as you know, in 2016, CMS put out a letter to the whole industry of what do you think about moving cataract surgery to the office? So obviously they've been thinking about it and, and we went back and did a little research and they've been working on this till two, since 2012. So it's coming. And we're spending quite a bit of time in Washington now uh, working with um, um, the Academy, ASCRS, who's, uh, and also with CMS. And um, eventually it'll come so that Medicare will be paying for in-office surgery. Because remember my four things, we know it's safe and effective. There's not really any question about that anymore. Uh, we know it's convenient. We also want it to be cost effective, not only for us as surgeons but also uh, for our industry, uh, because uh, we know that we need to look at efficiency and cost effectiveness in order to do the volume of surgery that we're gonna need to do over the next 10 years. So, um, uh, but this is not something you have to pay for your surgery center out of your professional fee. Uh, there is reimbursement. Uh, it differs by every state, even by all the way down to the county level. So that's something that, that uh, we uh, work really hard to kind of advise practices on uh, what their case mix is and, and how to get the best reimbursement that they can uh, uh, for the patients that are, they're doing. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, and I'd like to just, uh, uh, is there a confirmation a little bit from Lance and Allison and, and a Young that uh, that's what you, your experience has been? Yeah. Yep. I got head yeah. nods from everybody. Well, that's that's nice about video. On a on a conference call, you'd never be able to just answer stuff with head nods. Uh, it sounds like uh, the people back in Washington C D C are learning how to do um, uh, create legislation with just head nods now. So we we can use that. Um, another one of uh, uh, questions, and I, I really uh, want to tell the participants you're doing a really good job at throwing out some of the questions that we have. Uh, that you have that we can answer, and this is really uh, a really good. Uh, one question that came up of what about using single use uh, 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 equipment rather than sterilizing? I know that all the centers we do, and I know the three of you use regular sterilization just like you would at the, uh, at the ASCs. And um, we have worked with some centers in, in Europe. We had a conference call last week uh, because there's some countries that want to use single use uh, equipment. It's just really, really expensive. And remember, that was my number four. I think we have to keep that in mind. And, and sterilization, as long as we have the safety, uh, we know how to do that. We're used to it. Our staff is used, used, used to that. 
Uh, one question that's come up is a little bit about uh, training your staff. Um, I know that uh, you've all worked with Iowa Partners and they do the training with you. Is this really apprehensive for your uh, staff? And, and um, you know, because I know that you took people that hadn't done circulating and scrubbing out of your staff and, and uh, uh, trained them. Maybe Allison, you take that first. Uh, um, you know, with, back in July when you opened up, was there a little apprehension, apprehension in your staff? from uh, doing this for the first time? I think, um, you know, and I'll be humble and say, I think I had apprehension too. It's like, it's very different than what you were used to. And the psychology from a surgeon standpoint, I also had to get over that first day, that hump day of how is this really gonna go? And uh, um, it, it, I was just, again, um, pleasantly surprised by the support we also had from um, those with IOR, making sure that we had everything we needed, making sure that my team was trained, making sure that all the regulatory um, items that we had to keep um, my patients, um, my staff, and um, myself doing well, from all the equipment to the um, procedural manuals, all those types of things um, need to get done. And it's really, really nice to have that support. And I feel like my team um, felt that and they were uh, ready and prepared and we started slow I mean you start you start slow and each day after surgery you um, look at what went well what didn't do go well and you make changes that sounds good uh, younger Lance any comments about your staff and and um, uh, how that went yeah, I can speak to that. I that was one of my main concerns, and I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't have it in my original remarks. But one of my biggest concerns was training the staff because our staff was pretty good at, at, at being a, a tech in the clinic, and they had gotten to be pretty good at doing LASIK surgery. But in our intraocular surgery is a completely different ball game, and so we needed to train them from the ground up. And that's where you know Tony Burns and his team uh, was irreplaceable frankly i mean they they came in uh did a comprehensive training on sterile technique on instrument processing and all of that and then they were here with us on several or days until everybody uh was trained and checked off and then as we've brought new people in you know they certify them as we go along so um, now we've got several people that are trained to do what needs to be done and we've got a, a whole compliance program and uh, forms and documentation and, and training and checklists and logs and everything, just like any other operating room uh, facility. And so uh, that was something I was really nervous about, but it, it turned out to be, uh, once you get the process down, it turned out to be very doable. Yeah, I'm gonna jump ahead because we're getting some good questions here. Um, uh, and I wanna see if we can get as many of them answered. One of them I'll take. Uh, what organizations uh, accredited uh, office based surgery? The same accreditation and organizations that accredit ASCs. So it's uh, basically the Joint Commission, uh, Quad SF, and, uh, 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 and also uh, Triple HC. So they're accredited just like uh, ASCs There's, um, uh, and um, follow the same accreditation. And uh, we strongly suggest that uh, anybody that do this uh, get accredited. It has a lot to do with insurance reimbursement, which uh, uh, needs to have accreditation for doing that. Um, uh, the other question that uh, popped up is, is what about femto surgery? Lots of people, lots of our centers do femto surgery. It's just part of the, uh, their routine. And it's usually something that was, uh, was somebody was um, pretty used to femto when they did their in office. So they just stuck with it. Some people are not, but it, it's certainly something that, uh, that fits, uh, fits right in. Um, and um, that's, another, that's another great thing about, sorry to interrupt, but that's another great thing about um, the, the, the company as well as you as a surgeon get to individualize what you want. Um, so there's not, you have to have this or you have to have that, or you have to use this company. You get to do what you are, are you know, feel most comfortable with and you get to practice and do surgery how you want to do it. Yeah, it's so funny how a lot of the surgeons are so happy to pick their, their own chair they get to sit in. Because, you know, gee, you mean I get to pick out my own chair and I get to pick out my own uh, bed and my microscope and my FACO machine. So that's kind of gives you that flexibility that you didn't have before. I'd like to introduce Paul Kropecki uh, and then we'll get to, uh, continue the Q&A and appreciate all the questions everybody's coming with, in with. Um, Paul, uh, uh, give him a little bit of your background and, and uh, what you're doing to kind of grow practices. 
Sure. Um, Paul Carpecchi, as Dan said, I, I'm an optometrist by background. I had a unique path, though. I, I did a residency, and then I was lucky to do a fellowship under Dan Dury. Uh, he had to date us, but uh, 25 years ago, and uh, he took an ophthalmology fellow. He took many for many years, and he started an optometric fellowship. I was the second one, and it was a great experience. I mean, it just to this day, I still think of the things that it carried. And then we've always been working together on and off different things. And as IOR Partners was getting going, he called me up and said, hey, this is uh, kind of an interesting thing. And I listened to him, and I was intrigued. I, I, I knew this was the future. I knew this is where things have naturally migrated over many years from hospital, inpatient, hospital, outpatient, ASC, and, and naturally into in office or office space suite. So I think there's two parts to what everybody discussed so well. And, and I liked, uh, you know, Young's kind of over the, the bridge or through the valley as we've uh, discussed as well. And that, that time where we were here with COVID and, and certainly hope everybody was safe and their families are, are fine as we come out a little bit of the unknown. But there's two parts to office-based surgery. It's, it's having the office-based surgery that it works uh, for your practice and set up <clears throat> and then it's growing office-based procedure. So I'm on the lens-based refractive surgery team. And our goal is really to uh, use this. And it's amazing how much of the time we use during, you know, COVID-19 while, while practices were, you know, seeing a few patients, but really had this ample time. And it was so well received to, to be able to take them through the understanding of the opportunity that's there, the types of lens-based refractive procedures that are best for office-based surgery. And then we did this with doctor staff, and I can certainly go through all that with you, Dan, but I think my role has really been to help that growth for those who have office-based surgery. It sounds good. Uh, I'm, again, I'm, I'm going to start uh, focusing on the questions, and some of them may relate to you too, Paul. Um, one of them is, is a good question. It comes back to reimbursement, uh, and uh, does insurance and Medicare uh, pay significantly less for office-based surgery? Our experience has been it's been about the same. So the reimbursement that we're getting is pretty much at the ASC level for the physician. Um, and the, uh, the savings, a lot of it is in the fact that we, the patients that are uh, great for doing in the office uh, don't require as much IV sedation. So there's a savings of between two and $600 per eye uh, um, to um, uh, the insurance companies and therefore uh, also to Medicare. And it's pretty much realized, and uh, I have to remember that CMS, and we're watching him pretty closely, not only came out the request for information uh, about should we move to an office, I think we all remember when Anthem came out and said, do we really need standby anesthesia for cataract surgery? So you can kind of see the trends that are coming. Obviously, we always want the option of being able to do uh, standby anesthesia. And, and um, uh, that's why class B, which it can, you can do either, is kind of the, the way to go. But most of the patients don't need it, which saves costs uh, for the insurance companies. Um, um, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and do something now because we've got about 15 minutes left and we're kind of gonna field some of the questions. But I'd like to open it up to all four of the panelists on uh, what haven't we covered yet that might stimulate some more questions. And I'm gonna kind of go uh, in, in reverse order here and, and have Paul, you start is what things would you really feel like uh, for the surgeons and practices and, and the internal ODs that, that they should know about uh, uh, the office-based surgery trend? Yeah, I'd say there's a few things that come to mind immediately. Um, you know, one, one of the major factor is just the understanding the consistency of words that matter. And I know you've been a big proponent of words matter for many years, but understanding how we have to look when we're presenting, especially refractive lens exchange procedures or refractive cataract surgery procedures that are on the elective side, uh, to understand how the patients view it, I think is one of the key things. What words resonate with them? Like a clear lens exchange wouldn't resonate because why would you remove a clear lens? And traditional refractive surgery sounds very comforting versus basic cataract surgery, and which isn't so comforting. I wouldn't want to have basic surgery. And even though it's, it sounds like small little terms, it is very powerful in patient understanding and allowing for a consistency. And I think that should apply to everybody. And we've been lucky. We, every single practice in Iowa partners within two weeks went through an entire training on that as far as the, the surgeons and their administrative staff. And it was great to see that kind of response. The ODs though are also a um, wonderful opportunity uh, for lens-based refractive surgery. I don't think this is where you begin. I think you have to first, you know, have the consistency and the education of the three lens-based procedures, ICLs, RLEs, refractive cataract surgery. I think you have to have it uh, throughout the entire organization, the counselors, those answering the calls, 
and the staff and the optometrist in the office, but then eventually the referring optometric network once everything is consistent and proficient. But I've been fascinated uh, with the response from my colleagues. Uh, they, I've talked to a few of them who are, uh, one in, I was calling in, in North Carolina because he's the top referring doctor um, to uh, his number, I mean, two to three patients a day from his practice. And he happens to be in the same city as one of our doctors. So I called him up. I said, Eric, uh, hey, this is what I'm, I'm doing and I want to get your take. And we went through it. And he's, he's moved, he's going to move all his patients over. And he said the reason why he's going to move all his patients over was number one, uh, well, of course, we're going through COVID, was the comfort and the safety. He said, I was worried about sending patients back to a hospital. And he thinks of his patients as his, which makes sense. He's probably seen those patients for 20 or 30 years. And he says, so I wanted my patients really to be in the safest possible environment. I like the consistency. I like the comfort. And you saw Dr. Tendler's office. I mean, that's like going into a concierge, a spa. I mean, that's comfort. That's relaxing. That's what they want right now. The consistency of having one place to go to, they're not going to get lost. And the consistency of me being able to collaborate with that one office. And so I think that the other aspect is really the optometric opportunity. And again, I wouldn't pursue that immediately as you get into office-based surgery. I think you have to have all the other steps we talked about in place, but it does resonate uh, extremely well uh, there. And of course, very much with the way the patient thinks of things also. And uh, Young, uh, what have we missed that you really want to get across? Um, well, I think it's been well covered. Uh, one thing I'll say that, you know, when I started my office space, I actually like the comfort of having surgically surgically trained techs so i uh, i hired a couple more people and and instead of training clinical people to do surgery i just felt like you know when you're embarking on it something as new as you know office space i felt like i wanted to have the comfort of of having surgical people with me and i felt like it was easier to train surgical people uh some clinic stuff but i, I think it will work either way but I think some of the people out there may be more like me where, you know, we're creatures of habit. And so when you're in surgery, you want everything to be just right. So uh, some of you that want to have surgical techs, I think that's a great place to start. But Tony is great. He can train just about anybody to do surgery too or be a tech for you. Uh, Lance? Well, I'm just kind of going off the questions that we're getting. I think there's still a lot of questions coming in about the anesthesia. So I, I want to maybe clarify that a little bit for people just by explaining. I tried to answer some by typing, but here's how the anesthesia, the anesthesia works. So the, the standard um, out, office based surgery center that ILR puts together is a class B center, which means you can do up to IV anesthetic there. You can't do general, but you can do up to IV. So in our center, we do about 90% of patients with oral sedation. So just like we do with LASIK, we use Valium and we'll do five milligrams or 10 milligrams sort of depending on you know how big they are and how nervous they are. And then if I've got somebody who needs more than that or we think they're gonna need more than that, uh, we can do IV or we'll do like an MKO melt to get a little higher level of anesthesia. Or if I have someone who I think needs monitoring. So let's say they've got heart disease or some other comorbidity where we'd feel more comfortable having a CRNA monitoring the entire case, then I'll schedule them on a day when a CRNA can be here. And when I first started, I had a CRNA coming every week, and it just got less and less and less, and now they come once a month, and half the time we call them a week ahead of time, and we say, you know, we don't have anybody that needs a CRNA next week. So it just gets less and less, but we have the ability to do that if we need to. And I know that's a big deal to think about doing cataract surgery without uh, that level of anesthesia was a big deal for me to get my brain wrapped around that. I mean, I'm old enough to where when I was a resident, we were still doing retrobulbar blocks on 50% of the patients. And when I went into practice, I was a real cowboy because I was doing topical, you know, so that that's where I'm coming from on, on the progression. And now that's normal. And so the next step is, well, you don't really need an IV. It's normal to do PO. So it takes a while to get your brain around that, but if you do a few cases or come watch somebody do it at one of the existing centers, you'll see how great it is to do, do to do this under uh, oral anesthesia. So that, that would, that's one thing I just really wanted to emphasize, Dan. One thing, uh, it's always uh, having the experiences. When we opened up at Dury Vision earlier this year, we were in the middle of our training. 
So uh, Tony and his team had been out. They do a fabulous job. They trained all our staff. We didn't hire anybody outside. We just trained our, our essentially our LASIK staff and they've been uh, really good and really comfortable with this. But it was kind of funny experience as they did kind of their first surgical day uh, on a Monday in our office. And on Tuesday, uh, Jason Stahl called and uh, the ASC that he was normally uh, scheduled to on Tuesday um, had a contamination issue and shut down. So all of a sudden he uh, had to um, uh, either cancel those patients and Tony was still in town. So he called him, the crew came over and that afternoon uh, they did the surgery that day. And that was the first, on the Monday he used anesthesia. On Tuesday he didn't because he didn't have anybody to call in and he hasn't used anesthesia since. So it was kind of sometimes happens with by accident, but he kind of said, boy, that's great. This works good. Everybody was more relaxed. And so uh, that was the last case that he, he did in that. So is, uh, and jury vision, um, there was one question about how long does it take to set up a center like this? The fastest that Tony's tomb has actually done it is in six weeks. And in order to do that, you have to have the space pretty much ready and then the training and, and the, all of the things that go on. And we've even built it out, ordered the equipment, had it there in six weeks. But it really can take quite a while because a lot of times there's people are thinking about changing their practice, kind of like Allison did. Um, uh, when we built uh, the Dury Vision Center uh, three years ago, we planned on it, but we didn't do it right away. But then we had the area uh, already to build out and then um, bring the equipment in. Uh, and so uh, the vendors are really uh, excellent. Uh, matter of fact, I always jokingly say, our vendors like to sell stuff and this is a new place to sell stuff. And so they're very supportive of, of, uh, with their equipment. Um, they've done a fabulous job of, of kind of uh, servicing uh, the hospitals, the ASCs and the office-based centers that are coming together. Because we as an industry are very fortunate that our, our vendors are our partners with us all along the way. And especially during this crisis, they're all making sure that everybody is uh, safe and, and things are working uh, uh, well for them. Um, uh, as, um, let's see, I went from, uh, uh, I think I got everybody on that. Did I leave somebody out on that last question about anything you wanted? Do I, oh, Allison, I left you out. Sorry about that. Um, I think that we've pretty much uh, covered, I don't, you know, mine was kind of looking at the questions and the anesthesia uh, questions as well. So I don't, I don't personally have anything to add at this point. Um, somebody asked, do we have centers uh, up in uh, um, certain states? Um, most of the centers, and you won't be su that surprised, uh, like w of our 17 centers, we have three in North Carolina, but it's their certificate of need state. Matter of fact, we had an interesting experience with that is one of our centers that we were opening up as soon as COVID-19 cleared up, got uh, mentioned, and this is in North Carolina. He was called by his hospital-based ASC that he's been doing surgery for years and saying they're not allowing any cataracts till the end of June. So he um, is now bringing all these cases to, uh, to the office uh, just as a service uh, overall. And uh, he kind of mentioned the point where he sent a note to Tony and said, I think God sent you to me, Tony, you know, because he really feels like for his patients and his staff and everything else that now he gets to go going. Um, and I think that safety is paramount. You know, I mean, uh, it's number one on our list. Um, uh, I think that, that we continue uh, to keep track of data on all of the cases, the results uh, with all these surgeons have just been spectacular. So I think that that safety issue uh, always is number one. And um, I, I think we're gonna continue with that. I'm looking a little bit at the questions that are coming in. Oh, somebody said, do you still need a regular H&P just like you do to the ASC? So, um, uh, Allison, you can take that one. We, uh, at this, I know regulations just recently, recently changed on things for ASCs. Um, we have still been uh, doing H&Ps for our patients at this time. So and uh, Lance and uh, Young, we can do head nods here. I think everybody's still doing H&Ps and I yeah. think it's uh, appropriate. And yeah. it's part of the accreditation process too. And I think it's the right way to do it. Uh, Think of this a little bit as uh, you'd like to have surgeons be able to do their last case in the ASC on Thursday and the next first case in their office on Tuesday and, and feel just as comfortable. 
uh, as Allison said, you're always going to have that anxiety of, of, gee, this is new and, and the staff is going to be nervous. Um, and we certainly were at Dury Vision. It was just fun kind of watching uh, Jason Stahl, Tim Lindquist, fabulous surgeons, great staff. Uh, they were nervous, but they were high-fiving each other pretty much uh, that whole week during the training of how good they were doing and how, how much it, uh, it uh, uh, kind of eased some of, some of their tensions. Um, the, um, I'm kind of monitoring questions here a little bit. Uh, anything else that, that either, any of you on the uh, panelists had picked up from the audience questions that we need to cover? Oh, here's one. Um, volume, great question. Um, uh, um, in order to make this work, um, and I can tell you from the IOR partners level, um, you don't need to be as many uh, cases as it would take to build an ASC. If you're gonna build an ASC, you're talking about two and a half million dollars of investment. Uh, a lot of times you have to partner with other people in the community. You have to sometimes do multiple specialty. And it's much less expensive to do in the office because it's smaller. The equipment's the same, and, uh, but it's just smaller square footage. We can do a one room ASC, which we really don't recommend in the 800 square feet. Um, uh, but with a two room, which most people do with a, with a PACU, uh, it, it's really uh, around uh, 12 to 1300 square feet. So it's much smaller, so it's less expensive to build just from that standpoint. Uh, the uh, equipment uh, is essentially the, the uh, same equipment you buy anyway. Uh, your, your IOLs are the same, your PACs are the same, your, your um, you know, standby instruments are the same. So there is a cost savings, a lot of it has to do um, with the uh, space that's required. Um, but uh, fortunately, the reimbursement has uh, been uh, very good and makes it profitable for the doctors uh, to be able, able, able to uh, do these centers. Now I've got, uh, let me check one more time. I'm trying to do uh, three things at once here, but. Um, well, there's a question, Dan, on, uh, oh, and first of all, I meant to say happy birthday to you as we started out. I see all the e nice texts coming in saying happy birthday. Well, I mean, actually, the reason I hired uh, or asked Paul to come and do a fellowship is his birthday is the same day as mine, and that's today. So, so we have our birthday. I, I send a text to him at uh, 12.01 his time because he beats me to it every year. So I, I stayed up late just to be able to get him I was before he got impressed. me. I was impressed. Yeah, but one question came. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, questions on a lot. Of, a couple questions came up on. Um, the Kaiser study had in, by, incorporated bilateral same-day surgery. Do you feel this is a future trend? Is this more based, better for office-based surgery, uh, safety and eff, uh, efficiency perspective? I get that one a few times too. Yeah, well, I think that it's coming. Uh, we're actually, we're working on that too. ASCRS is working on a whole program for bilateral surgery supported well by industry. Oh, I question about premium IOLs. Um, uh, as you move from the ASC to office-based surgery, did the uh, did, how did it affect your number of people that chose premium surfaces? Was it the same? Did it go up or go down? Lance, you want to take that one? Yeah, it goes up. Um, and I think the biggest reason is just the overall ability to um, provide convenience for those patients. I mean, we have better control over the schedule. Um, you know, for example, we'll have somebody that's coming from out of town and they'll want to do a same day, uh, you know, see us in the morning, do surgery in the afternoon, leave the next day. We have a much more flexibility to do that than if we're dealing with a, another center. Um, so those sorts of things in, increase conversion rate. Um, they're also, if they're a little skeptical or, or uncomfortable, we just, we take them for a walk uh, down the hall and we show them where they're going to go. And they're like, oh, wow, that doesn't look scary at all that looks actually like a, a really comfortable place and so that gives them a a certain amount of comfort and so all these little things add up and uh you know it made it, none of them seem like a big deal from our perspective from, from the patients and they are a big deal and they can make a difference in their comfort level moving forward another question came up about our centers where are they um uh, i mentioned north carolina but um it's where the cataracts are um you know, Florida, uh, Texas, uh, um, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Alabama, uh, you know, in, but we have uh, centers in LA and, and we've got a lot of interest in, in, in people that are in different areas of the country. This is kind of universal. Um, uh, obviously we have South Dakota and Kansas City and Omaha, so right down the middle of the US. So, um, you know, that, that we're uh, doing these. 
So um, uh, we, let me check one more time about any questions. All the panelists get these to see if there's any that came up right at the end. We got like one minute left here. Um, one thing about charges, uh, uh, actually, I don't uh, talk to people about charges, uh, you know, on, on those things. We don't really talk about how much you charge, but I think it's pretty much the, the same in most of the practices of what they were doing before. Uh, obviously, everybody has a premium charge. If you do more premium, there's uh, uh, um, uh, is something that we look at that um, that uh, that increases your revenue quite significantly. And the industry likes it a lot when you guys use premium IOLs, so that makes Alcon and J and J and everybody else smile. So, um, uh, one question came in about can you do uh, an off-base surgery in a CON state? Yes, you can. So that's one area that why we have so much interest in the CON states is that uh, this is under your physician's license. It doesn't require a separate facility license. So you can do it in the CON state. So I'd like to thank the panel and everybody that participated. We had a great uh, uh, number of people and the interaction was great. So uh, we'll try to do more of these as we focus into the questions. And we'll also kind of turn it around a little bit for the participants as, as we'll be surveying a little bit uh, each of you on uh, what information that you'd like to know. And uh, this field will continue to grow. Um, most people predict that 10 years from now, um, you know, 50% of uh, procedures will be done in the office. ASCs won't go away, but we have so much more volume in, uh, of surgery to do in the future um, that um, uh, they're predicted that right now we do 4 million cataracts a year. Um, they're predicting that we're going to go to 10 million cataracts a year. And if we don't come up with more efficient ways to deliver for our patients, um, uh, it, it will be uh, um, um, a backup. So office space um, uh, is going to be more efficient, uh, more cost effective, as well as being safe and effective. So that I think that we, we kind of hit all my four key uh, parameters. So thank you, everybody. And everybody stay safe. I think we're all excited to start opening up the country uh, uh, and lead through safe um, uh, surgery as we get back to work, uh, kind of starting next week in a lot of areas. So have a great day. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Birthday. <laughs>